Um, next week, I think I'm going to share something a little bit different as I just kind of think about you as a church and, and your direction and just want to bless you next week with maybe something a touch different. Um, so I hope you've enjoyed the messages. And uh, if you haven't particularly enjoyed the messages, only one more to go So uh, after this week. So there you go. <laughs> um, I'd like you to open your Bibles <clears throat> uh, to... Where are we going this morning? <clears throat> 1 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, that's going to be our theme verse. And if you don't have a Bible, we're going to put it up on the screen. And uh, I've been, uh, th this Jesus is a series that I'm doing, and I've shortened it uh, quite a bit. But this Jesus is series, is the idea is that um, we want to know who Jesus is. And what he did. There's a lot of people out in, in, in the world that uh, think they know who Jesus is, but they, they proclaim a different Jesus than what the Bible teaches. And so um, this is kind of our theme verse uh, for today. And it goes like this. Uh, you'll remember, friends, that when I first came to you, I didn't try to impress you with polished speeches and the latest philosophy. philosophy. I deliberately kept it plain and simple. First, Jesus and who he is. Then Jesus and what he did, Jesus crucified. <clears throat> so we just want to keep it simple, very biblical, very simple of who Jesus is, what he did. And last week I shared how Jesus is the miracle worker. And we talked about miracles last week and how Jesus works miracles in our life even to this day. Sometimes, as I shared with you, sometimes uh, we receive the miracle. Sometimes we are the miracle that God, where he works it in our life for somebody else. So, but let's just pray. Today we're going to talk about Jesus as our best friend. Father, thank you, Lord, for this day. Thank you for your word. I thank you, God, for the opportunity to share your word. And I pray, Lord, this morning that we will look at Jesus and maybe learn some new things maybe we didn't know before. And all of this, we want to honor and glorify you. And we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. And so, uh, today I want to talk about Jesus as our best friend. Now, nicknames. I'm going to talk a little bit about nicknames. Uh, nicknames um, are great. Uh, they're usually given parents to children, and they, uh, they show an endearment from the parent to the child. You know, you, you, you probably know you've got nicknames for your kids. Uh, my dad had nicknames for us. I won't share the nicknames with you because my sister attends church here, and I'd likely not be asked to come back and preach again. <laughs> so I won't share our nicknames that we had. They weren't necessarily bad or anything like that, but they, they endear you to another person. Uh, I have a nickname in this town. This is my hometown, for those of you that might not know me. I grew up here, and uh, the nickname that I have in this hometown is Squint, S-Q-U-I-N-T. And I got that nickname because my Uncle George... Uh, had when he, he was called Squint by everybody uh, from the, that ever grew up in Nuevo from the 20s, the 30s, the 40s. Uh, uh, he had pink eye when he was a boy, and he'd always squint to see more clearly. And when I was in high school, after basketball practice, I went over to a friend of mine's house, and he introduced me to his mother. He said, this is Clint Abbott. And his mother said, oh, are you Squint's boy? And I said, no, 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 that's my uncle. My dad is Larry Abbott, but that's my uncle. But when my friend heard the nickname, he put it on me, ha, ha, squint, and I became squint. In fact, that whole generation, and some of you are in my era at Nuevo High School, it just seemed like everybody had nicknames. I've got this video clip I want to share. We had it from a time when we were honoring a classmate, a friend of mine, Sam Shepard, who passed away now, it's been 11 years, but we honored him, and in honoring him, we, I had this little p part of the video that I captured, and it's about nicknames. I'd like you to see it here at Nuevo. If anybody ever brought any friends in the Nuevo or family, we start talking to people and we start calling them nicknames. And they're like calling, hey, what's his name? And I says, for some reason we have tons of them. I'm just going to start the neighbor I grew up with, Tom Miller Mohammed, Tom Moore Bear, Steve Moore Vaughn, Tim Ray Kaza, Dan April Bernie, Fry Fred Fred, Craig Coons Bora, We'll have to go out to our famous minister, Clint Abbott, Squint, Brian Fosno Fozzi, Bob Hans Burt, Har uh, Mike Cook Harpo, Ted the White Panama, and the list goes on and on. One of the funniest ones that I remember that Sam came up with 
was we just were in biology and we went through Darwin's theory of uh, man. And we were looking at the stages of man and, you know, it starts in Neanderthal, ends up in cro -Man. So we go into the uh, gym, we're going to play basketball. We both just look over a, a guy who was bent over reaching for a basketball. With all the hair on his back and the position he was in, Sam yelled out, Java Man. And from that point on, Pat Over was always named Java. And Sam was one of the kingpins of the nicknames. And it was just something that uh, you can always remember when you listen to these people nicknamed, like Mike Clance Wetzel, and things like that. You can always remember Sam. Bye, all you guys from New Ego. <laughs> Okay, so, and that was from my friend Tom Moore Bear, but of course they spelled his nickname wrong on the video, B-E-A-R. That's not it. He got the nickname Bear because when we were in junior high, uh, that was back in the day when kids actually showered after P.E. class. <laughs> they don't do that anymore, but back then they did. We showered, and uh, we stole his clothes and hid them, and he was running around Bear, so it's B-A-R-E. But we all had nicknames, and it just kind of endears yourself uh, to, 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 to people, brings you closer, and you get a description of them. Well, Jesus' name was Jesus, right? And it says in Matthew chapter uh, 1 about Mary, it says, She will give birth to a son, and you will give him the name Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. But Jesus also had a nickname, and that is they named him Emmanuel, all right? And it says in Matthew, the virgin will be with a child and will give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. See, now that is unique because his name Jesus, 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 unique. Um, it's the idea of they're not only just being saved from their sins, but they were celebrating that they had God with them. In fact, that's why he got the name Emmanuel, because Emmanuel means God with us. See, many people who have never known him as the God, know, know, know him as the God who is close up. Many people know Jesus as the Savior, but they don't know him as a God who is close, who's real, that wants to interact and wants to live in and through us. In fact, that's just really an interesting verse. You know, in John 1, we don't have it on the screen, but in John 1 it says, uh, we have one of the verses, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Now, just a little side note uh, for teaching here, give you a two for today, give you two messages for one, all right, is in the beginning was the Word. The Greek word for word is logos, and it can be translated word, speech, reason, or account. And so you could really look at that verse and say, in the beginning was the Word, or you could say, in the beginning was the reason, and the reason was with God, and the reason was God. Now you get to John 1.14, and it says, and the reason, or the Word, became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Now that is called incarnation. Incarnation is the idea of coming into flesh. And Jesus came into flesh and made His dwelling among us. That idea of dwelling is, it literally means He pitched His tent. He tabernacled with his people because more than Jesus being a savior, which he is, he wants us to know him and, and, and God has always wanted to be with his people. In fact, just another little side note, none of this is in your notes, none of this is on the screen, but if you were to simply look from cover to cover in the Bible, you would find that God has always intended to be with his people. Before Adam and Eve sinned, it says that God walked with them. They had fellowship with God. They walked together with God in the cool of the day in the garden. And then after they sinned, we see evidences of a tabernacle. Okay, In Genesis chapter 3, uh, after Adam and Eve had sinned, it says in Genesis 3.24, and by the way, I don't, this is not available right now, but if you're interested, I could send you this on a podcast. Um, it says, and he, God, placed at the east of the Garden of Eden cherubim, which are angelic creatures, and a flaming sword, which turned every way to keep the way of those of the tree of life. Uh, the idea that he says he placed at the east of the Garden of Eden. Really interesting. Uh, a Hebrew scholar, dispensational teacher, E.W. Bollinger, many, many years ago, uh, wrote that that word placed is the Hebrew word shakan, and it means that he to dwell as like in a tabernacle. So there was a tabernacle there as early as in the east of the garden because God wanted his people to know him and his presence and worship him. In fact, it's just interesting, another verse of scripture which 
Um, you know, you can take it a different ways, but I just take it literally. It says uh, when, when Cain and Abel uh, had brought their offerings and, and uh, Cain was angry because uh, Abel's offering was accepted and Cain's wasn't, and so uh, he's mad at God, and God says, why are you so angry? The Lord asked Cain, why do you look so dejected? You will be accepted if you do what is right. But if you refuse to do what is right, then watch out. Sin is crouching at the door, eager to control you. And I always thought, that's really weird. Sin is crouching at your door. Well, it's the idea of the door of the tabernacle. All right, the door of the tabernacle. He's there at a tabernacle, at a place of worship. They were bringing their offerings someplace, and so that's what they did. In fact, it says in verse 16, uh, Cain went out from the presence of the Lord. Well, you can't really go out of God's presence because God is everywhere. So I really believe, just a side note, that there was a tabernacle there and that he left that area of worship and went off on his own. And then if you just continue to go through like the book of Genesis, uh, you have... Shem is, is uh, <clears throat> Shem, the son of, uh, you know, there was uh, Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Shem was the one that Abraham's line comes out of, and that Israel comes out of, and ultimately the Messiah. And it talks about the tents of Shem, that many people think that Shem was a priest, <clears throat> and that people would come to him as a priest. Another little side note, there are some people who actually think that Job, by the way, Job is maybe the oldest book in the Old Testament. Some people think that Job might have been Shem. That we don't know. That's more speculation. But just the side, just the idea of as early as Genesis, you have the presence of a tabernacle. You have the presence of God wanting somehow to be present with his people. Then you find by the, uh, when Israel comes along and Moses, they, um, they have a tabernacle. They have a portable church. They have a tabernacle. That's found in Exodus 25, and God gives them instruction. He leaves nothing to be, uh, uh, nothing to be uh, surprised about in terms of uh, the, the, the dimensions of the tabernacle. I think some of you here maybe have at one time, or maybe your kids have drawn or done, made model tabernacles. And uh, it, was a, it was showed the presence of the Lord. In fact, at, when, when Israel was wandering in the desert, there was always, and, and God's presence was filling the tabernacle, any Israelite could walk out and see, cloud by day, fire by night, could see that God was with them. And man, I'll tell you, when you're wandering in life, <laughs> you want to know that God is with you, all right? Well, then, as they take the land, and now they move into the period of the monarchy where they have kings, it is David's intention to build a temple, no longer have the portable church, let's build something, but it is Solomon who actually, through the wealth of David and Solomon's own wealth, constructs this beautiful temple. And then, of course, Jesus arrives on the scene in the New Testament, and, and, we, and it says he, he, has, he became flesh and made his dwelling, he tabernacled. They understood what that meant when John wrote that. They understood the idea of Jesus tabernacling, that we literally have God with us. And, of course, today, uh, Jesus, when he ascended, he sent the Holy Spirit, the advocate, uh, to be with us. And the Holy Spirit today, when we place our faith in Christ, he indwells us. And the Bible says that our bodies are the temple of God, where God dwells. And someday, someday when the Lord returns, in Revelation says there will no longer need be of a temple because God himself will be with us. All right? Well, that's just a lot to say that the Lord has always intended to have a presence with his people. He has always intended to be with us. And Jesus spent his first 30 years experiencing life like so many of us. He didn't even work his first miracle, as far as we know, until he began his public ministry, which is the one I mentioned last week at uh, the wedding at Cana when he turned the water into wine. But the first 30, going through life, identifying with, so that he could relate to you and me, he spent most of his time as a carpenter. See, he desires our worship. He provides salvation but he so much wants to have life with us. God wants to, you know, eternal life is both in the future, we look forward to eternal life, you know, when people pass away and uh, we know that they were Christians, we know that they are going to be in heaven, they have eternal life, but the gospel writer's audience understood that eternal life starts right now, right now. And it's not only that it's going to be everlasting, but there's a quality of life that we can have right now, enjoying his leading and his presence. He so much wants to live with us. And so it says in Hebrews, uh, that's why he had to enter into every detail of human life. 
Then when he came before God as a high priest to get rid of the people's sins, he would have already experienced it all himself, all the pain, all the testing, and would be able to help wherever help was needed. See, his present ministry right now is he's, Jesus is seated at the right hand of God with a high priest intercessory ministry. And because he's experienced everything that you and I experience in life, he can help us and he intercedes for us and we can experience that and enjoy that. You see, he can relate to us. He understands us. <clears throat> we can give comfort uh, only to the extent that we've received comfort that we uh, you know for example I can comfort people who have lost loved ones <clears throat> okay I mean I lost my dad I've lost a dad I've lost a father I've lost relatives I've been a, as a pastor for the past 24 years I've conducted many funerals I've been in the hospital when families have had to pray and decide to pull the plug <clears throat> I can extend comfort to a certain level now I have never experienced cancer in my life so that part, <clears throat> I can't really say too much about as far as my own experience. I can't bring comfort to the level of my experience. Now, one of my referee partners uh, who uh, was diagnosed with cancer a few years ago, he has been healed miraculously. The cancer's gone. And I watch him, and wherever, wherever we go, uh, he, can, he is able to extend comfort to others who have cancer. I mean, it was a few years ago, I believe her name was Pam Schmiegel. She was a referee out of Tri-County. And we were refing soccer one night at Tri-County, and they had this night for Pam because she had this very aggressive cancer, and we've lost Pam since then. But my partner just was very empathetic, and he went up and he consoled her because he knows what it's like to have cancer. In fact, he said, um, you know, we're going we're gonna to donate our checks tonight to the cause. I looked at him, what do you mean we're going to donate our checks to the cause? Oh yeah, we are, okay. So, but that's, he, he is able to, and, and we're able to do that. Uh, but you know what? Jesus can go beyond our levels of what we experience, because he's experienced everything. He understands. And so I want to share with you why Jesus is our friend, and maybe our best friend. Uh, first of all, he understands relationships. He gets it. He understands relationships. Jesus has half-brothers, half-sisters. You know if you have siblings, kids, it's not a life of peace, right? I mean, I know growing up what it was like and, and, uh, uh, with ki you know, as kids, and I just wondered sometimes when I read this, I think, I wonder what it would have been like to have Jesus as a brother. Because he understood. He had half-brothers, half-sisters, and he understood what, what, what life was about. He understood relationships. And I, and I can only imagine, that'd be really crummy if you're a kid growing up and Jesus is your brother, right? I mean, you're trying, you're going to get away with something, right? And you're right on the edge of getting away. And mom says, okay, Clint, um, you better ask him. Because if you don't come clean, I'm just going to ask Jesus. And we know Jesus is going to be honest, right? Jesus is going to speak the truth. And I couldn't imagine, you know, I can only imagine that maybe Jesus was found one time with duct tape on a chair. You know, they duct taped him around a chair because they didn't want him to, to, to tell what they did. But he understands that dynamic. He knows. He gets it. He understands. And when his family would listen to him, they would think he was out of his mind. In fact, that's what it says in Mark 3. It says, when his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said, he's out of his mind. And that's why Jesus could do very, very few miracles. Very few miracles he could do because of their relationship of family, because they didn't have faith. They looked at him as, you know, he said a prophet is without honor in his own country. And so, but he understood. He understands relationships. He gets it. He also understands life. I think the real Jesus is... Um, well, I think he was really well portrayed, by the way, in, in Mel Gibson's The Passion of the Christ. I, I, you know, anybody see that movie? Yeah, well, most of you, yeah. I remember going down to Chicago um, with a group of pastors to see a preview of the, that movie and had a chance to meet Mel Gibson. And, uh, you know, so many times Jesus is really painted as the, ro the white robe guy. And I, I really think that... Uh, he was tough. I mean, he spent the first 18 years as a carpenter. I think he was a man's man. I don't think he's always the white robe, gentle spoken guy. I think he was a t-shirt, blue jeans, you know, toolkit kind of guy. And uh, <clears throat> now he probably had to deal with tough customers if he was a carpenter. 
He probably had to deal with, you know, he had business to run, he paid taxes, he was likely rugged, I think he knew how life was. He was a man. I think he had blisters and calluses. <clears throat> and I think he understands that about our life. Um, it says in Hebrews chapter 4, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, and yet without sin. And see, when you understand that about Jesus, you can relate to him differently. He also, he also understands pain. He understands pain. Emotional pain, you know, can be worse than physical pain. Isaiah says uh, in Isaiah 53, when it talks about the suffering, that's the suffering servant section of Scripture, he says, He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows, and familiar with suffering. So if you've ever been despised and rejected, if you've ever felt that way, he understands. He gets it. He understands suffering and the things that you go through. And to whatever degree of suffering you might experience. All right? Uh, I remember when I was in junior high, I was really, well, when I was in junior high and high school, I was, I was always just a small, skinny kid. I mean, I, I heard all the skinny jokes, right? I mean, I, they'd say, he's so skinny, he needs to run around the shower to get wet. <laughs> Yeah, people would say, he's so skinny, if he just st stands sideways and sticks out his tongue, he looks like a zipper. You know, so I would hear all those skinny jokes and, uh, and teasing. And, and then one time, a girl, when I was in uh, eighth grade, a girl that I was seeing, uh, she got mad at me. Literally, she picked me up and she stuffed me in a locker. <laughs> so, you know, but Jesus understands that kind of pain. If you're just, a, if you're just, I could give you the name, but I think she lives there around the area, so I won't give the name. Uh, but, you know, uh, he understands even that small, simple, you know, teenager level of pain that teens experience, that peer pressure stuff that they go through, to the extent of pain that you and I as adults experience too. Uh, he understands it. He understands it. He, get, he gets it. He knows uh, about suffering. When we suffer, when we have the loss of loved ones, he understands that. And when we physically suffer, maybe we've got, uh, maybe we've got, maybe we're struggling with cancer. Maybe we're struggling with diabetes. Maybe we're struggling with uh, aging and, and things not working the, the way. Jesus understands that so much. I mean, uh, he went through so much. He went through crucifixion. The worst form of punishment that anybody could go through was crucifixion. Isaiah 53, 5, two verses over, says, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our, our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds we are healed. So he understands whatever level of uh, uncomfort, uncomfort, whatever level of, of uh, persecution, whatever level of uh, uh, hurt and pain we're going through, he understands that completely. And the next time you hurt, you can understand that. He's not judgmental. He gets it. He was a man. He was a person. He understands and all of this means that Jesus really does qualify to be your best friend. So, and thinking about a best friend, um, I want to share a little. I want to share about my best friend before Jesus. <laughs> um, when I was in uh, junior high school, seventh and eighth grade, my best friend was a guy by the name of Randy Ruggles. He and I were inseparable. Tight. I mean, we just hung out all the time. They lived over <clears throat> by the uh, old middle school on Washington. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, he and I, we just we hung out all the time. And then his family moved. Just going into our uh, freshman year, the summer of 1970, they moved to uh, the Phoenix uh, Mesa, Arizona. And we kept in touch. We would write back and forth. And over the years through high school. And uh, then I was going to go out, actually, because you know, I was a wild and rebellious teenager, and I was doing my own thing, and I got booted from high school my, <laughs> my junior year. And uh, that's a whole other story. But um, uh, that summer, I was going to go out to Phoenix, and he had a job for me, and, and that's what I was going to do. But at the last minute, things changed, you know, one of those fork in the road things, and I ended up staying and did not go. And it was just after that time, after the summer of 73, 
that we lost touch with each other. And I couldn't locate him. I couldn't find him. We just lost touch. Found out later on he went in the military, had a few moves. But, you know, um, uh, and, and this is a kid that, this is one of these blessings that God gives us in life. Okay, so I'm the kid that got booted from high school, never graduated from high school. I went back and got a GED. Uh, to this day, I, I have no high school diploma, but I got a college degree. Um, but, uh, but my class so much, you know, that's the benefit of growing up in a small town, right, like Nuego. They had just took me in, and I've been to every reunion, every uh, re class reunion we've had. In fact, I'm on the reunion committee. In fact, today, to this day, they look to me to be one of the, the leader of the class, so to speak. Uh, I get that. I have married many of their kids. Um, I have buried some of my classmates. And, and so uh, um, on the reunion committee, we always try to find when we have a reunion, uh, we find those people who we've lost touch with over the years. And, and if you're in a high school class and you've been to a reunion, you know what I'm talking about. And he was one of them. I, every now and then, like every decade, Shows you how old I'm getting. This, you know, now you talk about decades, right? You know, every decade I would think about Randy, and I'd think, I wonder what he's doing. I wonder where he's at. And I'd try to find him. And you know, this is before this is before the internet and before computers. You know, we'd actually we'd get on a phone and uh, we'd call information. Now, for those of you that are under 30, we actually had land, regular telephones, and we would dial a number. Anybody remember? That? We'd dial a number for information, right? And you get an operator, and you'd say, I'd like the number of such and such in this city. And they'd actually try to connect you and find you. And I couldn't find him. I could not find him. And that would go on, and then, it, and then you know, on with life, and so on. Fast forward this past December over the holidays. I don't know why, I, but I hadn't thought about, about him in a while. And the Lord just kind of brought him to my mind. And I thought, Facebook. I get on Facebook. I can't find him. Um, I type in Randy Ruggles. You know, it's like, you know, you type in somebody's name on Facebook, like there's lots of them. <laughs> there's lots of them. And so I uh, didn't find him, but I found his brother, Ron, who was a few years ahead of me in school. And I wasn't sure if I had the right Ruggles, but then I saw Ron, now I'm going to throw out some, was, and I saw some other Nuego names that were common friends of his. So I'm going, okay, I'm in the right place. So, uh, then I see on Ron's page um, this lady posting things, and I don't recognize her name's Connie, and I don't recognize the name, so I'm looking through pictures like many of us do, you know, like, we're, uh, it's kind of creepy, right? right? Facebook stalkers. <laughs> but I'm looking through, and I see this picture of her and my friend Randy. I know it's him. He has hardly, hardly changed at all, you know, and I'm going, that's it. And I met, I, I met, I private message her, and I say, I explain who I am, I explain her background. Is your Randy? And yes, my Randy is your Randy. And I thought, awesome. Well, then I found out that he has, um, um, uh, what do they call it? It's uh, o, o, C, o, C, what is it? COPD, -O -O thank you. Obstruction of the lungs, pulmonary, usually caused from smoking, not always, but usually in his case it was. And he was like stage four. And I didn't know what that really meant, but I didn't take that. It was very good. So he's on oxygen. He's only got, uh, he's down to 35% use of his lungs. So I'm thinking, I'm just so excited to finally found my friend. So I say, hey, can I come out? Is that, and they just wanted me to come out. So, but the only way I could make it, I was teaching, teaching part-time at the Potter's House High School. So I, on spring break, I went out. And unbeknownst, I forgot, his birthday was the day I arrived. So I arrived on his uh, on his birthday, and I walked in the door, and you can show the picture, and uh, there we are, uh, there we are, 1970, that's me on the left, that's him on the right, uh, and then there we are, 2018, the first time we'd seen each other in 48 years, uh, and me on the left and him on the right, and we hugged, and we cried, and Michelle had said to me, you know, what do you think? I mean, that's 48 years. That's almost like 50 years. You never want to say 50. It really puts us out there age-wise. But, but, you know, are you guys even going to relate to each other? The chemistry was there. It was like we had never, it was like it was 1970 again. We picked up where we left off. We stayed in touch. And so we had a great, great visit. I was with them all day, took them out to lunch, went out, the, and uh, it was just fun. Okay, you can flash. So... Uh, that was just an awesome, awesome thing. And I told him I wanted to walk with him on his journey. And I said, Michelle and I will come out 
uh, maybe the end of summer, and because Michelle wants to meet you, and so on and so forth. Now, I know many people have said, and, and, and maybe you're thinking, but many people told me, oh, Clint, that was, you are just real. I mean, what a friend. What a friend to do something like that, to go through that expense and time and all that. And he is my friend. But I let him down. <laughs> as good a friend as I am, I let him down. I couldn't come out. We were supposed to go out. It had been last week or the week before. And we just had situations come up. I had a brother-in-law that's been a missionary in Chile that, that, you know, unbeknownst to me, picked this particular time to come up. And he came up. And just finances weren't always right. So we just... We couldn't do it, and I let them know we couldn't make it, but we'll plan another time. And I know they were a little disappointed by that, as I was. I tell you that to say, Jesus is even a better best friend, and he never lets us down. He never lets us down. He is there, it says in Proverbs chapter 18. You got it on the screen here. A man of many companions may come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, I remember... In 1985, Michelle and I had been married about 11 or 12 years at that time. And, and we just had some struggles, some speed bumps in the, in the marriage. And, it, and so we, we sat down, though, because what was happening was we, had put, we put all of our trust in each other. And we realized that we are fallible. I will let her down and she will let me down. But Jesus never lets us down. And so as much as we want to be there for each other, we also know that Jesus, we can forgive because we know that Jesus is even better. He's there all the time. He never lets us down. He is your best friend. So just a couple things to do that I want you to do today is one is make Jesus your best friend. Okay, Facebook people, we've been talking about Facebook. We're actually Facebook Live this morning. Right now, i got these guys up here. Um, you need to change your status. You need to change your status. Your relationship status should be with Jesus as your BFF, right? Your best friend forever. He's not just a flannel graph, savior, and robe guy. He is your best friend forever. He is God with us up and close and personal. He doesn't just want to be somebody who's out there, not the man upstairs, not the God who's distant. He wants to be the God who is in your life. This is what he says in, chapter, in John chapter 15. I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends for everything that I learned from my father I've made known to you. Make him your BFF, your best friend forever. He understands you. He gets it. And he wants to do life with you. And because he understands you, secondly, talk to him. All right? Not formally, not ritually, not in the King James language, okay? But, you know, prayer, talking to God is, that's what praying is. Praying is talking to God. And just be real. Just talk as you would talk to someone else. It's, uh, it's not an event. It's a conversation. You talk to him. You can't text him. Well, you could. You could text him, but he wants you to talk to him, all right? He wants you to talk to him. And you, in normal conversations, just share your heart with him. And it's okay to repeat. My wife does not like me to repeat anything. <laughs> Michelle, does, if I tell a story and, I've, and, I'm, and she's already heard it before, she lets me know. Uh -uh, we're not going to listen to that. You already told me. I've already heard that dumb joke, uh, Clint, before. But guess what? He wants to hear my dumb jokes again. He wants me to repeat. He wants me to talk because he is a best friend forever. He wants to do life with us. Uh, he wants to walk with us. He's interested in us. He's given so much. He understands so much about us. And so in Hebrews says, chapter 4 says, Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. He knows he understands. And when I do this, when I approach him, I get three things. I get mercy, I get grace, and I get help. And that leads me to one more thing, thing number three to do, and that is to trust him with your life. Trust him with your life. He cares that much about you. I've shown you how much he knows and how much he's experienced and how much he is, wants to do life with you and walk with you. He doesn't just want to be Jesus who's up here. He doesn't want to just be the flannel and robe Jesus. He wants to be the one that's in your life every day. 
The one that you'll make a commitment to because he won't let you down. When you say, Jesus, I'm going to meet you tomorrow morning at 5 a.m., he's there. I'm going to meet you, Jesus, at noon, he's there. He does not not show up. He does not say, I can't make it, but I'll be with you in spirit. He doesn't do that. He shows up, he's there, he's real. And so make him your best friend forever. I don't know where each of you are in your spiritual life. I just know about my spiritual life, and I know there are times, even as a believer, that I had found myself distant from God. And as the old time person said, you know, when God seems so far away, guess who moved? It's because of me. Because he's there. He's dependable. He's a best friend forever. Make him that. Talk with him. Converse with him every day. And trust him with your life. With every head bowed right now. Eyes closed, head bowed. Hand the controls of your life over to him. We just need to change our relationship status to know him as God with us, a friend who understands us. He's made his move and he wants us to make ours. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I'm just going to say a verse of scripture. You can think on it, meditate. But to all who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. All they needed to do was to trust him to save them. And so, right now, from where you sit, I just want you if you've been far away, maybe you haven't, and that's great, but maybe for those that feel like he's been distant, he's not, and he's ready, and he's waiting for you to make your move, and that is to receive him, to renew your faith in him, to renew your commitment to him. Because when you commit everything to the Lord, he will help you. And so right now, with heads bowed, eyes closed, just pray with me in your own words. God, thank you for sending Jesus, for praying for my sins and being close to me. Today, I'm, I'm, I'm renewing my commitment to you. Forgive me for going my own way, for not realizing that you want to be with me up and close and personal. Come into my life, make everything brand new, and I'll serve you and love you with everything I have. Eyes closed, head still bowed. If you prayed that prayer, then I want you to share that with me just by raising your hand when I count to three. I just want you to share with me. And it, and it doesn't, sharing doesn't make you any better. It just means you're moving your faith forward a notch. And so on the count of three, if you've prayed that prayer, just raise your hand. One, two, three three hands up yes amen thank you thank you thank you thank you so much amen i see the hands thank you father for those that have just wanted to move their faith up a notch and lord we know that even if we didn't raise our hand you know our hearts we love you we praise you and we are so glad that you never let us down father thank you for this time thank you for the service thank you for this church god Thank you for Pastor David and Bree, and I pray you'll bless them and put your favor upon them, God, and that, that this church will just have an amazing, continued amazing impact into this community. Sharing Christ in real, intangible ways. Father, we give you glory and honor. We thank you for this service. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.